Hello, this is Marcos Patchett, the Nocturnal Herbalist, and today I want to talk all about chocolate, or in specific, to be exact, the drinks that were made in ancient Mesoamerica, that's uh, sort of Central America today, from the cocoa bean or cacao. And those drinks, although we would recognize them as chocolatey, uh, were not uh, were, were quite dissimilar from the forms of chocolate we have today. And if you read conventional histories of chocolate, that part of the history will often be glossed over in a couple of sentences as like the, the Aztecs and the, and the Mesoamericans made drinks out of the cocoa bean. Uh, the drinks were thought to be highly stimulating. They were quite bitter and not sweetened. And nowadays we've made it into a much better, pro a much better product that tastes a lot better. Thank goodness for technology. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it might be that over, say, 3,500 years plus, probably longer, because it's thought now that cacao, the tree, Theobroma cacao, from which, uh, which is the cocoa tree, from which the cacao bean uh, is taken. Uh, it's sort of grown in pods on the tree, and then we harvest the pods and take the beans out and ferment them and make them into cocoa um, or chocolate or whatever. Um, that tree may have been domesticated as far back, possibly, as even 30,000 BC, not sure of the dates, but I, it's all in my book, uh, The Secret Life of Chocolate, which I spent 13 years to date uh, researching and writing. And by researching, I don't just mean time in libraries and uh, lots of time looking into the science online and whatever, although I've done that. I also mean I've spent, uh, I, I, I've done three trips to Mexico and Guatemala, three six-week trips, got over 20 hours of interviews with different coranderos, different farmers, different historians, different people who work with chocolate and using traditional processes. Uh, and uh, I've kind of carefully assimilated all the information and pieced it together in an effort to try to um, understand uh, the history and the background about uh, of chocolate and in specific of the cocoa bean as as deeply as possible. So uh, yeah the drinks that were made from the cocoa bean in Mesoamerica would have been quite bitter and quite sour most of the time and but very flavor complex, extremely complex. And I know because in the book, there is a whole recipe section where I have reconstructed and in some cases reimagined, but with as much historical authenticity as one can manage, um, given the sources that exist, I've reconstructed as many ancient and traditional cacao drinks as possible. Now, sometimes that's relatively easy because there are some drinks made with cacao that are still sold and made in Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras and Central America generally. And they tend to be the uh, lower class or more um, widely available drinks made with maize. They're sort of padded out into a gruel and some of them are quite elaborate. Um, but the more uh, high level, high class, expensive drinks traditionally in Mesoamerica would have been made with cocoa beans, water and spices alone. Um, but the process of making them is quite elaborate and sophisticated and the flavors would have been quite sophisticated, although usually not sweet. But the, the, the Mayans, um, and the Aztecs, or the Mexica as they knew themselves, we call them the Aztecs, they call themselves the Mexica, hence modern day Mexico being named after them. Uh, they did make some sweetened cacao drinks. They used honey occasionally to sweeten the drinks, but for the most part, uh, cacao based drinks were taken uh, without sweetening. Uh, and they would they were often very foamy. The foam was thought to be a really important part of the drink because for various symbolic and sacramental reasons, the foam symbolized life in the same way that a fermented beverage such as beer, it had a life force of its own. You can see that in the bubbles coming out of it. Um, and in chocolate, although the foam was whipped into the drink, Although the cocoa beans are fermented, the drink is made from the beans after they've been fermented and toasted um, and processed. 
uh, by hand into a paste and then that that liquor that melted cocoa paste is mixed with water and then frothed usually with the addition of other spices occasionally with foaming agents to increase the volume of that foam so the foam in the traditional cacao drinks was uh, sort of artificially generated and it was thought that in whipping the air into the drink you were essentially whipping life into the drink it was like a magical process so some of the things that really fascinate me about the whole history of it is, uh, well, first of all, the pharmacology and the properties of the drink, because we know that cacao uh, and chocolate are drugs. And I use that word advisedly because drug comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, drigon, which means dried, as in dried plant, because a drug in that sense is usually a substance ingested for medicinal effect, usually made from dried plant material traditionally. So that's one connotation. But the second is the vernacular, the common, uh, the slang parlance today, drug meaning something that you take to get high. Uh, and chocolate also does that a little bit. I would argue. Um, the fact that it's so common nowadays means that we take its effects sort of for granted in the same way that we take the effects of tea and coffee for granted or you know other intoxicants like alcohol. It's just sort of mm, every day, but it, it definitely does produce a high. It's just that we're so, you know, like Alan Watts says, the fish doesn't know water. You know, if it's around you all the time, you don't necessarily recognize it. But I think the traditional drinks, I don't just think, I know, the traditional drinks made with cacao were much more potent. So they weren't potent to the extent that they would blow your head off, but their effects are much more noticeable in terms of they generate a more noticeable stimulation, a more noticeable euphoria, a more noticeable shift of perspective after you have ingested them. And that is simply because the concentration of the actual cacao seed in them is much higher. Your average bar of chocolate is made with cacao seeds, which are themselves 50% fat and maybe contain something like, I think about 4% polyphenols, 4% alkaloids. The alkaloids are the bits like caffeine that stimulate the central nervous system and do other things, but that's the sort of stimulant motor bit. And then the polyphenols are antioxidants, but also modify the effect of the alkaloids because the polyphenols are what are known as some of them are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the subset of the polyphenols called procyanidins. Uh, and I think a couple of others, it's in the book anyway, lots of research in the book. Um, but they, they, they're not strong monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but what that means in non-technical common language is monoamine oxidase inhibitors are substances which inhibit an enzyme a catalyst of chemical reactions found in our bodies and our brains called monoamine oxidase. <laughs> and the job of monoamine oxidase is to break down monoamines. Now in the brain, well monoamines everywhere are things like single amine substances like serotonin, like dopamine, like noradrenaline. I think most people watching this will recognize those names as being the names of neurotransmitters, that's chemicals which in the brain make you happy or lift you up or more alert. They do other stuff too, but in the brain, that, those are some of their roles. So when you take substances that inhibit monoamine oxidase, the enzyme responsible for breaking them down, the levels of those substances increase. And cacao does contain substances that do that, principally the polyphenols. There are also a couple of other trace alkaloids that do that. In fact, cacaos, uh, I call them the fairy dust constituents because they are found in very low quantities, so low that if you pick them out of the bean individually, their quantities separately look like they wouldn't be enough to do anything. But when you look at those separate little constituents, I call them the fairy dust constituents, all together, you notice that they will probably have additive effects one plus one equals two, maybe even synergistic effects. One plus one equals 11. They, they add up to greater than the sum of their parts. Um, and the, my evidence for that can be, I've, I've got lots of evidence in the book in terms of sort of animal trials where they 
torture animals, which I'm not happy about, but it has been done, that show uh, effects in the brain of, of, of cocoa and cocoa polyphenols and, and so on, um, where they raise the, the level of central serotonin. Uh, they certainly... <laughs> Anyway, it's too long to go into, but basically the fairy dust compounds, the mixture of trace compounds in cacao, I am fairly confident and hypothesize with a reasonable degree of, not certainty, but confidence, yes, uh, that they add up to tickle lots of different pleasure circuits in the brain simultaneously. So they, for example, uh, sensitize opiate receptors. They increase the receptors of monoamines, such as adrenaline, noradrenaline. They increase, uh, my phone's going off, typical. The only one time I'm doing a video today with phone rings, never mind, ignoring it. Don't have time to edit this video either, so this is gonna go out as it is. However, um, yeah, so they, they increase the level of, of noradrenaline and all the happy chemicals, the increased level of opiates. Um, now, and I think there's some other chemicals that they do that too. Phones distracted me, never mind, carrying on. The, 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 they add up to um, basically increase the level of pleasure and happiness and whatever. But in, in human terms, I think cacao ends up being what I would call, the term I've used for it in the book, is a hedonic modifier. The levels of this, 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 the level of strength of this activity on its own isn't sufficient for the drug to be a pure antidepressant or to generate euphoria. But what we found from human trials with just ordinary eating chocolate is that ordinary eating chocolate can increase um, the effects of intention on positive mood. So eating chocolate doesn't on its own generate a good mood allegedly, but it does, if you want to be in a good mood, it'll increase the intention to it. And that's something that was found in, in a couple of small trials. We also know from the animal experiments that high doses of cacao reduce conditioned fear, which is really interesting because certainly what some people say, oh, chocolate's just basically caffeine with packaging and all of its effects are down to caffeine. Well, caffeine doesn't do that. Caffeine, in fact, does the opposite. It increases conditioned fear. Conditioned fear is uh, the kind of learned fear reaction. Its most, its highest or most extreme expression would be something like PTSD. And the, the effect of cacao, at least in animal experiments, was to reduce that. And uh, other supporting evidence for that would be in some brain scans of people taken after they'd eaten, again, ordinary eating chocolate. Uh, the amygdala, the region of the brain which generates fear responses, was um, lit up, but very interestingly, more so in women <laughs> than in men. Now, this could be just a, because of course there are biological sex differences between male and female brains. Um, as on PC as that may sound to some people today, it is actually a fact. So, uh, but that also may be a dose related issue. It may have been the fact that if uh, a higher dose of chocolate or the real thing, what I would consider to be the real thing, the drinks, the original recipes made from the beans only would have generated a much stronger effect in men as well as women. Uh, there's other supporting evidence. Again, all of this is in the book. The link will be in the description box below the YouTube video. And I'll probably run it across the screen for people who don't want to take the time to look at that. Um, one of the uh, other bits of supporting evidence was that there was the American, um, I think it's Addiction Research Center, did a, uh, a survey of um, people uh, maybe 10 years ago now, and they found that the people who um, described themselves as uh, wanting more, as being a little bit dependent on chocolate were um, more what rated higher on the morphine benzedrine scale, meaning that they were inclined both to opiates and to uh, amphetamines or stimulants, both of them at the same time. Um, which is really interesting. And interestingly, in their little survey, they found that more men than women 
were uh, fell on that scale. So it could be that some of the preferences, we don't know yet whether some of the preferences for chocolate may be partly due to brain wiring, say hypothetically, if women get more of an anxiety or fear reducing effect from chocolate than men do, or whether it may be culturally determined because uh, chocolate is often, not always, but often marketed more towards women than to men. Um, possible. Anyway, in my view, the eating chocolate that we have now is the kind of methadone version of the drug. It's a drug that is less effective in terms of its pleasurable effects and in some ways more addictive and it's certainly less beneficial because it's made with a lot of added fat and added sugar. It's not to say it's bad. There have been lots of trials on chocolate reducing the risk of heart attack and stroke, often quite significantly. I'm talking about dark chocolate here. Sorry, milk chocolate fans, but the milk content and the added sugar in milk chocolate reduces the brown stuff, the polyphenols, the actual uh, chemicals in the cocoa bean that provide some protective effects. Uh, particularly against heart disease and stroke, it reduces them too much. So it's dark chocolate that's been found to have some benefits. But of course, the traditional drinks, which were made often without even sweetening them, with just the beans and water and spices, uh, would have been much more powerful. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in this video is I'm recording this uh, in sort of mid-October 2019. On the 1st of December this year, uh, myself and a herbalist colleague of mine, Melinda McDougall, we're going to be doing a one-day cacao uh, workshop, a sort of cacao ceremony, if you like. I'll explain a bit more in a second, in uh, Neil's Yard in London. So uh, I'll, again, I'll put the link to that on the screen and below. So have a look. If you're interested, please get a ticket and come along. Um, essentially what we'll be doing is uh, I'll be making a traditional Mexica chocolate drink. So one of the foamy concoctions. Now I will be adding maple syrup to it. That's the only historically non-authentic ingredient that I'll be adding for those who want it. It does taste nicer sweet, um, but for those who don't, or those who are willing to, or want to taste the original, authentic, unsweetened Mexica drink, uh, I can also make it not sweet. Uh, all of the ingredients and processes I'll be using are historically authentic, as far as I can tell from my research. Uh, so that it's, it's based on a, a Mexica recipe, which was recorded by um, Hernandez, a Spanish doctor who was sent over by King Philip II, I think, of Spain, who was King of Spain at the time. They sent him over and he did a huge survey of, um, of Mexico, or New Spain, as they called it at the time, and all the plants and animals and medicines and traditions that they did there. And he recorded some of the recipes that the Mexica made. So Hernandez's recipe for uh, the drinking chocolate was cacao, uh, vanilla, or as the Mexica called it, clilsochal, which translates as black flour, because it's a fermented pod that goes all black when it ferments. You've seen vanilla pods, right? And uh, the fruits, uh, the dried fruits of uh, Pippa auritum, which is known as holy leaf or hoja santa in Central America now, which is sort of like a peppery, it's in the black pepper family, basically, Pippa being the pepper family or pepper genus. Um, so the, the dried fruits of that are kind of peppery, but with a very distinctive, slightly aromatic flavour that comes from saffron, uh, a chemical in it. In high doses, saffron is carcinogenic, but there's not enough of it in there to be problematic. So, And then the last uh, spice that's used in there is um, uh, Symbopetalum penduliflorum. Uh, which is known in common parlance as ear flower because the dried petals of the flower look kind of like little ears. They actually look more like that type of pasta called conchigli, you know, little pasta shells. They look like brown, highly aromatic versions of, of them. And uh, that smells sort of like a really, it sort of looks and smells almost like a, an aromatic leather is the closest I can, I can say to it. Like the, the smell of, and I'm a vegan, so I don't appreciate the killing of animals, but the smell of leather, like new leather, it's kind of got that, but a more perfumed, um, rich, resiny smell to it. It's quite, it's very unique, and it combines exceptionally well with the flavour of cacao. 
So those three spices, plus cacao, plus water, plus a foaming agent. The foaming agent I have used uh, are these fermented seeds of patashle or Theobroma bicolor. Theobroma bicolor is a close relative, as you may guess, of Theobroma cacao, the cocoa tree. Uh, Theobroma bicolor is sometimes known as the jaguar tree because its pods have this sort of like mottled sort of skin that look a little bit like, with some imagination, a jaguar skin. And the seeds are much less bitter than cocoa seeds and they are fermented in a very special way, uh, buried for six months underground to ferment in water-filled pits and then dug up uh, and washed and dried in the shade, at which point they are completely white and sort of have a crumbly feta cheese-like texture and virtually no odor and no taste really, just sort of like a slightly chalky taste, but they are a phenomenal foaming agent. Um, so anyway, that's the basis of the drink that I'll be making. The recipe, of course, is in the book. All the ingredients and processes are traditional. Um, so I'll be making that on the day of the ceremony and then uh, dishing that out to everyone. And while everybody is absorbing their dose, I'll talk a little bit about it, give a bit more background, maybe answer a few questions. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Melinda, who works with a group called Street Wisdom who take people around the streets of, of London or other cities and um, it's I regard it as a kind of divinatory exercise but one might just as well say it's a sort of psychological exercise whereby uh, Melinda will be the guide and she'll give people um, a few little pointers on things to think about while they're walking around and then everyone will be sent off to walk individually for an hour with a question in their minds which they should answer and Melinda will give people a few techniques uh, to, to use, a few mental techniques so that they can find answers to questions in their subconscious mind. And all of this is based on cognitive science, um, it's not based on superstition, but I love the fact that traditionally cacao was used in uh, Mesoamerica. Apart from its use as a daily drink, it was used as a sacred drink. And um, I haven't really talked much about that yet, but basically the drinks, as well as being used at feasts and celebrations and drunk by important people, drunk by commoners when they could afford it, and those who lived in areas where it grew, those who lived in areas where it it didn't grow, couldn't afford it back in Mesoamerican times because cocoa beans were used as money. So literally drinking the drinks was something only the rich could afford because you were drinking your money. It was a, uh, it makes me laugh because it's like money literally did grow on trees and it was a, an early form of conspicuous consumption. But anyway, um, they also used cacao the, and the drinks particularly as a sacrament in their um, religious rites. Now, Mesoamerican religion was fundamentally shamanic in a sense, meaning that it was magical. The intent was to communicate with the gods and bring down power that could be used to make things happen in the world. And the Maya even had names for this power. The intent was to, um, by shedding their own blood or the blood of a sacrifice, it's pretty hardcore, yeah? Uh, they would, <laughs> it is. They would shed their blood and they saw the blood as being a, a repository of, of chulel, which is one form of soul. They had different ideas about the soul, that the soul was split into different parts. But anyway, this video is going to be long enough as it is. So Chulel was the Maya name for the soul that resided in the blood. It was like the same soul that the ancestors had. So if you communicated with the ancestors, it would be their Chulel that you would communicate with. And that was shed in the blood and you would sacrifice a bit of your Chulel. You would literally, in their rituals, give away a bit of your soul in exchange for this substance from heaven or from the other world, which would come through the portal, which was the place where they were doing the ceremony, uh, which was set up in a particular way. So that there were four directions and the priest or the person performing the ritual stood in the center. Uh, they did the sacrifice or the king or the noble or whoever it was did the sacrifice or somebody was sacrificed and their blood was shed and that uh, spent a bit of chulel of soul stuff and in return they drew through the portal this stuff the Maya called its which was literally kind of magic fluid <laughs> and there was certain substances in the physical world which were thought to be 
highly concentrated in its or magic power. And those would be generally substances which were from living things and were liquid and then turned into solids. So examples would be rubber, which of course was extracted from the sap of trees like Castilla elastica, which was liquid and then it would set. Similarly, resins from trees, other tree resins, which could of course be burned as incense, they were thought to be very concentrated in its because you'd cut the tree, it would bleed this fluid and then that fluid would coagulate. Human blood was another source and cacao or chocolate because it was liquid when you ground it and then if you allowed it to evaporate or dry it would literally congeal. And of course what's true of all of these substances is they all had extraordinary properties. So tree resins would often have medicinal properties when they're burnt they release these fantastic aromas that changed your state of mind. Like rubber you could make uh, bouncing balls or stretchy materials from and chocolate of course when you ingest it made you feel rather good. So it was a, a, a powerful source of magic stuff. So it was used in ritual as a substitute for blood rather as say Christians would use communion wine in an analogous way because of course wine, dark red wine, looks like blood, um, transports you. If you drink it you go into an altered state drunk but it's a similar analogy. Here is a here is a drink that congeals with its, you know, it has this, this power of being able to morph, uh, going from a liquid to a more solid state, which is analogous to drawing a power down. So it comes down from the rarefied uh, region of the other world above, the heavenly world as it were, and then densifies. So, uh, and I think the pharmacological correlate of that, the reason for that in terms of pharmacology might be that uh, cacao does, I suspect, reduce conditioned fear. It is an antiphobic substance, not a really, not an incredibly powerful one. It's not like MDMA to the extent that it will temporarily obliterate your con con uh, conditioned fear, but it will certainly, I think, smooth the edges off it. I've made a comparison in the book between cacao and MDMA because there's, while they're pharmacologically quite distinct, there are some very interesting uh, parallels between them that I don't think are entirely um, factitious. I think there are several interesting parallels which I've made in the book. Anyway, um, Although their actions are quite different, there are parallels between uh, effects if you look at the social and, and anyway, all that's in the book. The point is, I think uh, chocolate works as a hedonic modifier and a mild antiphobic substance. And it's these pharmacological properties. Certainly we know that chocolate and cacao ingested reduces the level of adrenaline in the blood. It definitely reduces the level of cortisol and the excretion of cortisol, the stress steroid, and it significantly raises the level of uh, a breakdown product of serotonin called 5-HIAA in the spinal cord, which is a, it is a marker of increased serotonin turnover or metabolism in the brain. Those are definite. The things which I speculate on the basis of some pharmacological activity is that cacao increases opiate sensitivity, increases monoamine sensitivity and turnover, possibly by activating trace amine associated receptors or TAARs in the brain. Anyone interested in that? It's all in the book. So the point is, I think um, its magical properties are that it essentially opens that door. It's what I would call a proto-entheogen. An entheogenic drug is a drug which is inhabited by a god or allows you to be inhabited by a god. So like in, in a traditional sense, that would be something like mushrooms or peyote, something that's obviously hallucinogenic although I hate that word because it's so inaccurate, but um, something that is psychedelic, something that changes your perception on a macro scale hugely so that you can no longer think as you normally do. Cacao isn't that potent, but in a sense it's more valuable because you retain all your normal functions and perception, but it's just shifted a bit. It's just made a little bit more open. Uh, and interestingly, at the feasts of the Mexica, they used to, uh, as, as for fun, but also for divinatory purposes, they would drink chocolate and eat mushrooms, magic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms at the same time. By the way, I'm not recommending that you do this. Obviously, there are legality issues with many of these things, but certainly not with chocolate. So 
Um, we won't be dosing anyone with mushrooms, but we will be dosing everyone with very high doses of quality, traditional, historically authentic chocolate. And then Mel will be taking people on a guided sort of walk around your own psyche, and then we'll reconvene and have another dose of chocolate and talk about it for a little bit, talk about what people have experienced. Uh, so the, the purpose of the day, apart from anything else, it'll be a fun day out with good quality traditional chocolate and some interesting information, but it will also be a good way of opening up new possibilities in your life potentially. If you have a question or a conundrum in your life, then some of the techniques that Mel will be using, uh, the street wisdom techniques, will be those that help you get at answers. Uh, from your own mind, you know, just from yourself. Yeah, they, they help you access that. And I suspect, and this is the entire intention of it, that the chocolate will facilitate that process because it will just soften those um, barriers of fear-based resistance a little bit, which is why I think it was sacramental and so highly valued in Mesa America, apart from its flavour, you know, which is nice. Mm. Anyway, I've gone on quite a long time uh, I'm going to try and whack this together and get this out this weekend. Um, I haven't forgotten my cancer series video. They, the videos, they are still going to be coming, but I'm going to be interspersing them with videos about chocolate and the manufacturing of traditional chocolate drinks and, and how that's done. So uh, there's going to be a sort of uh, splicing of those two uh, streams of uh, video. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you if you've watched it all the way to the end and uh, please have a look at the book in the links and have a look at the chocolate ceremony in the links. Uh, thanks and goodbye.